are giving me your life and saving no one. <laughs> so much for love. All right. Hey guys, this is Tim. Welcome to Conversations with Christians. This is a channel where we help give you the confidence to engage in dialogue. We equip you to defend the historic Christian faith and of course to grow as a disciple. So that was a clip from the 2006, 2006, 2007, 2006 uh, Chronicles of Narnia the movie adaptation, which is very good, but there's a problem with it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So this is a little bit of a theological discussion. This is why it's so important for us to have good theology and to understand theological concepts correctly and, and have a, a right understanding of doctrine and things like that and not skirting from doctrine and, and, and what I would call the clinging to what I would call the, the mere Christianity movement. Not mere as in the C.S. Lewis book, but mere as in we'll, we'll save that topic for another time. But there's a problem with uh, C.S. Lewis and Chronicles of Narnia. Now, I am not going to drag Chronicles of Narnia through the mud. I think Chronicles of Narnia is a wonderful book. It is a wonderful movie. And my kids, when they are old enough, will certainly enjoy both of those. But as we grow older, as we grow in the faith, it's important that we bring our our understanding of God and Christ and the gospel into uh, into a mature a more mature sense to to really understand what it is that Christ accomplished and why the gospel is what it is and why the cross played out the way that it did why that was God's plan before time and all eternity so when we look at the scene here that we're looking at in the movie uh, you have the white witch and she kills Aslan, who is the Christ and the God figure in the story, if you're not familiar with it. Now, he's a pretty clear figure. Um, it gets a little tricky, especially in areas of like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, to say, okay, the ring, that is sin. And Frodo, he represents man. It's not quite that clear cut. It's more it's more along the lines of themes. You can recognize Christian themes throughout there. Uh, but when it comes to Aslan in, in uh, Chronicles of Narnia, it's pretty obvious. Like, this is the Christ figure. Uh, his death here is a portrayal of Christ's death on the cross. In the moments leading up to this, Aslan's walking up. Uh, the, the hordes of the White Witch, they're all hissing at him. Uh, there's a humiliation involved, just like with Christ leading up to the cross. Aslan is knocked to the ground. They shave his mane, you know, all to humiliate him leading up to his death. But the thing that's different there and the thing that we need to understand and that ultimately we need to help our children grow in understanding is why did Aslan die? And this is the disconnect between the gospel, the biblical gospel and Lewis's portrayal in the Chronicles of Narnia. So in this scene, the reason that Aslan uh, had to die is he died for Edmund. Edmund was one of the children, and Edmund did something that warranted Edmund's death. And Aslan stepped into uh, Edmund's place and took that death. And you're probably thinking, hey, that sounds right, and so far it is. But the whole reason is why Edmund had to die to begin with. And in Narnia, Edmund betrayed, uh, he betrayed Aslan. And because, and the law of the land, because Edmund betrayed Aslan, uh, Edmund's life was owed to the White Witch, who is the Satan figure. Edmund's life was owed to 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 him to her. Uh, and there was a loophole that 
the witch didn't know about that Aslan could step into Edmund's place and die instead of as instead of Edmund. Now, I hope I'm not losing you. I'm talking too back and forth. I feel like I'm talking too too much back and forth on some different points, but uh, here's here's the real the true disconnect. Aslan died to appease, to satisfy the witch. Okay, in the biblical gospel, Christ died to satisfy God's wrath. Now, I was sitting at, uh, I was attending, I wasn't participating in the panel, but a panel recently, a panel discussion between Christians and atheists. And the, one of the atheists asked the question to the, to the two Christians, what are we saved from? And the Christians, I, I thought, I think they did a good job overall, overall in the evening, but they, they, I don't think they handled that, Christ, that question really well. And this is one of the reasons I want to talk about this, because we should be able to talk about this and explain it to others. We are saved from God. Now, that might sound odd. How, how does Christ die to save us from himself, the triune God? Well, it's because God is just. And let me go ahead and hop back over to... Whoop, there we go. Um, our Bible here. And let's talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say that we are, that God saved us from himself. Now, I really wouldn't use language like that too much. It's kind of an oversimplification, uh, but it is not it is not incorrect. And it would have been a true statement had those Christians said that to the atheists. And it would have been an excellent example or a launching pad for them to talk about sin and, and truly why Christ had to die and ultimately the gospel. So when we see in Romans, and you're probably familiar with this verse if you've read your Bible to any degree, and Romans 3.23, and let's look at a little bit of the context for that. So verse 21 says, But now the righteous of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, this is the important part, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if we were to... Compare that to the story in Narnia. Everyone is Esmond, Edmund, right? Everyone broke the law, okay? Everyone has earned death, which we see uh, in Romans chapter 6, at verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know two things. We know that sin, the wages of sin is death, okay? We have earned, whoever sins earns the death penalty. Okay. And then we know in chapter three, everyone has, okay. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have earned the wage of death. Now, where does that wage of death come from? It doesn't come from Satan. Now, Satan may carry out like, just like it was the Satan's desire to see Christ crucified. And, and it was certainly an evil behavior that drove the nails into Christ's hands. But Christ, the triune God, allowed that to happen to satisfy the justice of God. Because God is so holy and his law is so much higher than any law we have here on earth. Any law that we can think of, whether it's the municipal laws of the city and the county or laws of state or the federal government, and each tier, that law is more severe. Well, if you imagine, if that tier could go all the way up to the God of the universe, that's how severe it is when we violate God. Um, God's law. And that's, that's what sin is. It's violation of God's law. So in Narnia, Edmund betrays Aslan and as such, he owes his death to the white witch. She is entitled to his death. And that is not a part of the gospel. The God in the gospel, we have sinned and God being perfectly holy and perfectly just must have the, must execute the death penalty upon us in order to uphold that perfect justice. Now, Christ steps in and he pays that fine that we owe. He pays that for us so that God can have mercy while, and, and grace while also upholding that justice without compromising it. Now, think of this too, just to make my uh, point further here. Think about the flood, okay? God did not lose in the flood, okay? God was victorious in executing his wrath and upholding his justice towards an evil world. That was God executing judgment upon the world. It wasn't Satan claiming victory. That was God executing his righteous judgment. 
And the flood is another great example of how we may look at it as children in one way, but we really need to come to understand the true meaning and the tragedy of the flood, the severity of God's wrath and judgment. If you've ever been to the Ark Encounter uh, run by Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, if you've never have, I would highly suggest it. It's, it's an awesome time, the, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. And they actually have a little exhibit there uh, dedicated to the children's version of the Ark story. Now, there are totally appropriate times for children's version of the Ark story. But my takeaway and the point I want to get across here is that we have to grow from that, okay? When we read Bible stories to the chil to our children, um, I'm currently using the biggest storybook Bible, and it's fantastic. Uh, it is a little watered down in places because it's, it's, it's intended audience are, is small children. But I shouldn't always use that. I, I My children will grow up and they will read the real Bible and they will read the true scriptures and in all of its seriousness and all of its joy and it's all of its fullness, the whole counsel of God. But we've got to understand that there's a time and a place for the simplified versions of the stories as we're growing in the faith. You know, we don't always want to remain babes in Christ. We want to grow in our knowledge, grow through sanctification, let the Holy Spirit grow us in that sense. So uh, C.S. Lewis was wrong. Uh, I, I haven't really looked too much into the, the history of it. I don't know if he intended to portray it that way. So I'm a proponent here of the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. And that is truly the, the, the standard evangelical Protestant view on Christ's atonement. Now, C.S. Lewis could have disagreed with that, but uh, any very, I will look, oof, got a bug in here. Fly. I will look in that. I will look into that later, but, uh, Penal substitutionary atonement was not portrayed in the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan died to appease Satan, not God's wrath. So I hope that gives you something to think about. Um, there are other versions, uh, not other versions, there are other uh, things out there in kind of Christian, in popular Christianity culture. The shack is one of them. And I plan on talking about some of the theological problems. Um, I read The Shack a long time ago, and I really loved it when I did, but I would have to say I, I was probably not as far along in my faith journey as I am. Well, I was certainly not as far along as my faith journey then as I am today, and there are some real problems in The Shack in, in terms of uh, some of the theological issues that it draws. Um, I think they're a little bit more severe than Lewis and Narnia here. Uh, I think Again, I said I think Narnia is a wonderful story. My kids are going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it with my kids. Um, but it's going to be a conversation that we have as they grow. Uh, I'm not going to let them stay in that world uh, of Narnia. They will. I will help guide them into a more mature, full understanding of the gospel, what sin is, who we are, what that sin problem is, the life Christ lived, uh, the life that Christ lived here on earth to uphold God's perfect standard, and why He stepped into our our place and took the wrath of God upon Himself, so that we could have free and everlasting life with God in heaven by grace through faith. So this is Tim. I hope that was interesting for you. If you've got any questions for it, please drop me a comment, send me a message, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And I would love to engage with you guys and hear any thoughts that you might have. Uh, until next time, God bless, and I'll talk to you later.